Well, good morning. We're going to go on a new exciting adventure. I felt like a kid in the candy store when I got these books in the mail yesterday. I waited three weeks for these books to come. I ordered them from uh, Study Shelf, which is Clyde's site. And uh, the mail, of course, has been delayed and delayed and delayed because of this stupid virus crap. Um, but coming across border, these actually went to another place first. It went down east first, and then they actually had to reroute them to come to me. But it's amazing. God still brought them to me. They did, get, did not get lost in the mail, which I'm so thankful for. And these are the two books. The first one, I'm going to start with this one, The Writings of William B. Screws. Now, he does, and does the expositions Pilgrim's Messenger. You can find these writings, actually, on the Herald of God's Grace. So if you know where that website is, and if you've gone there, you see that all those authors, he's in there as one of the authors. So you can find his writings there. It's tremendous. He was an associate of uh, Enoch, and he does some beautiful writings. So I'm going to start with that one. This next one I'm very excited for because I didn't have this book. And when Nelson, our brother Nelson, brought the last four shows before he went to repose, he was using this book. So I'm actually going to go through the whole thing. If you already have ordered it and gone through it, well, I'm going to read this on my show. God's Celestial Purpose by John Essex, Studies in Ephesians. Beautiful. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So it breaks it down. Breaks it down beautifully. So that is the, the book I'm going to go through after the writings of W.B. Screws. So good morning and welcome to the show. An exciting new adventure. I have more material to go through now. Different material which I'm thankful for. Not saying the unsearchable riches aren't good. But this is an exciting new one, right here. And I'll start with the introduction, give you a background on this uh, brother of ours. <coughs> okay, he was a primitive Baptist pastor who went to heralding the salvation of all, or the evangel. William Benjamin Screws of Glenville, Georgia, was an able advocate of the Pauline Gospel and staunch defender of the ultimate salvation of all mankind. He had an extensive teaching ministry that was concentrated, but not limited to, the southeastern United States. He, he was also a longtime editor of the monthly periodical, The Pilgrim's Messenger, like I told you. This book is a collection of choice articles from that publication. To make a living, he worked as an editor and reporter for two local daily newspapers. He also served various positions with the Glenville Chamber of Commerce. A. Nock referred to his laborious zeal for the truth as a firebrand and a man after my own heart, going on to say, when he sees God's truth, he stands for it, unafraid. This should be us. When we have God's truth, we should stand for it unafraid and herald it out. There is nothing half-hearted about his ministry. His paper is the greatest little sheet I ever saw. A former pastor, Screws, Screws described leaving his denomination. In August 1932, I came to the point of choosing between the organized quote-unquote church and the truth of God. I chose the latter and thank him that I was so led. I was dismissed from the church, where I had served exactly half my life, 24 years. 20, 24 years, wow. I was given a letter of recommendation as to character and faithfulness, but the letter stated that the church was dispensing with my services and dismissing me as a member. How many people have gotten booted out of the church? Even like the pastors. If they see the truth, they get kicked out of the church. Because I did not believe according to the accepted doctrines of the primitive Baptist church. The letter did not claim that I had taught contrary to the scriptures. So they had to give it to him nice, you know, a nice letter. And, oh, we, we have to dismiss you of your services because of blah, blah, blah. 
but they don't give them the actual reason. So that's something else. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to go with chapter one. God is really God. That's the title of it. God is operating the universe in accord with the counsel of his will. And life and death are in his hands. Not in the hands of man. What an opening statement there. This is not known among the ultra-religious. They are too much taken up with their own importance and with their belief in God's inability to carry on without them. This recognition of the sovereignty of God is found mainly among those who have never been in the spotlight of the religious world. That God is operating the universe in accord with the counsel of his own will Ephesians 1.11, we know that verse, is a satisfying truth to those who have learned that God is never under the necessity of giving an account of his doings. But to those who do not concede to him the right of absolute sovereignty, this passage cannot seem true. So all you free willies out there, you don't understand that passage, Ephesians 1.11. Not having... Full confidence in him. They cannot conceive of him as the source of all. Once we see that his goal is the justification of all, Romans 5.18, and the salvation of all, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, and the reconciliation of the whole universe, Colossians 1.20, and that everything between the beginning and the consummation is a necessary step in reaching of the goal. We not only see that he is operating the universe, but we acquiesce in it and thank him for it. Job, the man who spoke that which is, that which is right concerning Jehovah, asks in all seriousness, What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Job chapter 2 verse 10. Since we learn to value good only through an experience of evil, there's nothing strange in God bringing evil upon us. His chief aim with man is to reveal himself. How could any person appreciate him for what he is unless there it has been an experience of evil? We all know this very well. How can we appreciate God's good and what he graces us with if we do not have the experience of evil? We all have the experience of evil to humble us by it. Adam had no more appreciation of God than a hog has of a tree from which the plum falls. This is why it was necessary for him to be brought into an experience of evil. Some of the most majestic words ever spoken by Jehovah are found in Isaiah 45. Yet to the average religious person, they seem partly untrue. Here they are. I am Jehovah, and there is none else. There's, there is no God beside me. I gird at thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the east to, and from the west, there is none beside me. That I am Jehovah, and there is none else. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Jehovah, do all these things. So there it is, Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 7. When the sun is gone and darkness spreads about us and we feel apprehensive and little children cling closely to their parents, it is Jehovah who has created the darkness. Just as it is, he who forms the light when the sun shows itself above the eastern horizon. Peace in his creation, and so is evil. He who would say that God makes peace, but that evil is no creation of his, is simply broad, broadcasting his own unbelief. <coughs> Amazing stuff this is. There is a future period of peace. In this we exult by faith. War shall cease, and peace spreads and peace will spread its beautiful wings over all the earth. When this comes to pass, it will be the doing of Jehovah. But not any more so then the present evil is of make, his making. Before the world will learn that wars are futile, that evil must increase, 
Nations must be exhausted. Man's fighting power must reach the bottom. There must be untold suffering. This evil will prepare mankind to appreciate the peace which will be brought to the earth by the Prince of Peace, who is Christ. The world of mankind has never yet wished this prince for this prince. Men have, too, have had too much confidence in themselves. We see it all around us. The confidence must be lost in the prevalence of evil before the world will be ready for him who brings the true peace. Men have largely lost confidence in the ability of the masses to man manage affairs. They are turning to leaders more and more. Even in our own country, there is a feeling of helplessness. Do we see that today? Wow. We are helpless. We are under the control of the governments of the world right now. Every single human being that's on the earth is under their control. And this must be. This is God's plan. It's, e it's, it's the Eonian plan. This is how the wicked eon will end. Man will have to co come to the end of themselves and God will bring it about. So far as the wisdom of the multitude is concerned, and we are trusting more and more in one man's wisdom. Right, so it's a man. It is not Christ. It is a false. It is the Antichrist. It is the man of sin that they're looking for. And they will get him. Trust me, he's coming, and he's right here at the doorstep. He's already on the earth, I believe. <clears throat> In other countries, on both sides of this titanic struggle, mankind looks to leaders more than themselves. This will continue until there is a worldwide confederation looking to one man to run the affairs of the world. He too shall fail to give men what they desire. When the failure of, the, of that dictator is fully manifested by his ignominious defeat on the plain of Megiddo, the Battle of Armageddon, it's actually on the plain of Megiddo, this great battle, and that's in southwest of Jerusalem somewhere. The, er, the world will be ready for the Prince of Peace. It is then that he will take the helm. They who have a program of their own have neither time to consider God's program nor faith to believe he has one. They will concede that there is indeed a program, but it is one that God has given them to carry out. They do not believe that he has told them exactly what it is, but that this only shows his faith in man's ability to devise something that is better than he could suggest. This is why pastors spend so much time planning what to do and how to do it. They don't simply bring broadcast truth. They don't herald the evangel. None of these pastors, they work so hard at spewing out the lies from the pulpit. I have in mind a young man who in former days listened with apparent interest to the truth. Now he disdains not only the truth, but those who preach it. What has happened? why he has been given a place of prominence in the church, and on his shoulders is much of the task of carrying out its program. So, anybody that apostatizes and goes that direction, once knowing the truth, and now he has to go and open this church and do all this struggling with uh, getting programs and shit together, it's sick. Because they want to look good, these pastors, they want to look good as the man of God, when they're not. False apostles, fraudulent workers, false messengers of light, which are false. The, this is Satan's stratagems. Such people, if honest, are bound to know that the program of man is fast failing. And if they are sincere, it must give them many an anxious moment. They cannot see ahead, nor can they believe there is anything better unless man can think of it and bring it to pass. They are thoughtless ones who refuse to see that man's efforts are failure. They believe man's ingenuity will yet devise something that will work. It'll fail, 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 fail. That was actually the first chapter. Look at that. 
Tomorrow I will read the second chapter, which is the placer and subjector. Beautiful. These are small little chapters, and I love it. Easy reading on here, and the writing is so awesome. As you can see, the writing is just plain and clear and easy to read. I mean, I'm half blind even with these glasses, so this helps. You know, bigger writing. I love it. I'm so thankful for these books. And I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm able to share them with you. This is exciting news. Exciting news that I'm giving you. Man will fail. God will prevail. He is a subjector and placer. And he's putting everything into place. So why do we stress about the shit around us? I have no clue. Most of us are stressing about the news and the world and all this other crap. M many in the body are just enthralled by this virus shit and watching the news and just following shit. I don't. I can't. It's sick. Like the world is right now. Sick. I love you all. Have a wonderful Tuesday. I'll be back tomorrow with more exciting adventure writing. <laughs>